Welcome, Welcome back. back. Welcome back. And uh, so, you know what, Cynthia and I have been sitting here just briefly talking with our good friend Cleo Miller, who is a Browns alum, was with the Browns from 1975 to 1982, Two. right? Yes. So anyway, Cleo, Enough with the formalities. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so good to have you on. But having said that, you know what? I feel like I've known you for a while now. But at the same time, you know, there are some things that, you know, I would like to know more about you. And I'm sure our audience would, too. So let's just start back, like, way back. <laughs> you know, when you were a kid. And talk about your growing up years and, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, <laughs> so I guess when when I start back, thank you for having me here again today. But uh, knowing Cleo, you have to go back down south, okay. far down south. <laughs> down yeah, south, and, okay. And, and you have to talk about things that people don't normally talk about in this day and time, and that's on plantations. My grandparents were sharecroppers. I grew up on a plantation during the summer. I would go and spend time. Yes, I know about chopping cotton, milking the cows, feeding the chickens, slapping the hogs, doing the whole gamut. I know from sun up to sundown when you go out in the fields and stuff, you tell what time it is by looking at your shadow on the ground. Oh. I know about the whales and stuff where you go in and you pull, put the little bucket down there and pull the water up out the right. whales and different things. Yes, Cleo has been through a lot. <laughs> you know what, Cleo, and I can relate to a little about that because, you know, I'm from the South, too. Uh -huh. I know you're from Arkansas. I'm from mm -hmm. North Carolina, you okay. know, but mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Wow. Yeah. I, you, you did take us a little back. Now, did you have brothers and sisters out there? Yes, uh, actually, brothers and sisters? I, I had three brothers and uh, eight sisters. Okay. Ooh, big family. And, yes. and where, do you, where do you fit in there, I Cleo? I fit in is the third person okay, okay. and uh, and I guess you know when you when you you come up being the oldest son and then you have a tendency to have the weight of the world on your shoulder because my father left my mother when I was I was told when I was about three years old oh. so I grew up without a father figure wow. and uh, you know I have half sisters and half brothers you know in the house but my mother she did a domestic work to try to maintain and do things to keep us together hmm. And so, uh, you know, when you, you look at all that stuff and how you came, I was the first person in my, in my family to get a high school degree, a college degree, and a master's degree and go on and play professional football. Hats off to you. And That's so, wonderful. Yeah. That's a testament to your mom. Because we want to get to that, too, but what kind of kid were you? I mean, were you like one of those bad kids? Or <laughs> what? Well, you know, the thing about it is that you know, everybody, it <laughs> when they grow up, they're, they're mischievous to a certain degree. Okay. But... Uh, Growing up, you know, it was at the time when the neighbors disciplined you just as well as your mothers. Mm -hmm. You know, the village raised a child, mm -hmm. and I can recall many a times, when, even when I went to school, I got a whipping in school before I got home. You know, I got another whooping by neighbors and my mother whipped me. Now, notice so, he, didn't, he didn't say paddling. Uh, he no, said whipping. Whip. <laughs> there is a difference. <laughs> there is a difference. Yeah. That's right. That's oh, right. Yeah. So you, you have a tendency, especially also growing up with grandparents, too. Mm -hmm. And there's still certain things inside of you as a young person that, you know, this, you take this through a lifetime for you. So it's values and stuff that you create. Then coming up with growing up on the welfare system, too. And, uh, and uh, living from house to house, moving back and forth and stuff. So at the age of about, uh, I'd say when I was about, well, actually six years old, I was in the cotton field, and the cotton field with a pillowcase on my back picking cotton, and it started from there. Wow. And so from that point on, I've, I grew up understanding and knowing how to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had to have jobs in between everything else, you know. And so you, you learned work ethic oh yes. early on. Oh, yes. Probably, mm -hmm. number one, witnessing your mom. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah well, mm -hmm. I learned it f from her, but also from the grandparents and everybody else, too. Right. And as I said, six years old in, in, the, <laughs> in the cotton field with a pillowcase in the back picking cotton, that's... You know, mm. it, it tells, you know, and it's not just picking cotton, it's chopping the cotton and soybeans and the whole gamut, planting the, the gardens, the whole gamut. But now was education stressed as well? I mean, so could, because I'm wondering, you know, you said you're the first person in your family mm -hmm. to have a high school diploma mm -hmm. and then go on to college. I mean, tell us a little bit about how all of that happened. How did you become the first? Well, first of all, you have to think in terms of trying to escape, get out of that situation. Yeah. And so uh, as a little kid growing up, we didn't have a professional football team and think, you know, around the closest team to us was the Dallas Cowboys. 
but we would get out in, in, in the community and we'd play games and stuff. And I was a little kid running around with the big guys. And uh, I'm, I'm, I, I was literally about five or six years old. These guys, 16, 17, 18 years old. I'm out with you know, playing <laughs> okay. sports. Wow. They're kicking me around, <laughs> stuffing me and everything else. And then one of the guys who eventually uh, wound up uh, being a brother-in-law of mine gave me a nickname after a great uh, uh, football player with the Detroit Lions by the name of Dick Knight Train Lane. And they said that I was going to be just like him one day. Oh, so that okay. inspired me right there. It gave me an opportunity to go and say, well, you need to do something. So uh, I, I was always a good student in, in elementary school coming up. Mm -hmm. And then when I got over into high school, junior high school, it was a different story yeah. because I had begun to really become pretty popular in the in this football arena you know playing with the kids playing sound like football as a matter of fact all the other kids were going at the school playing when i was playing sound like football and they used to tell the coach all the time about you need to have that they gave him the name dick night train lane too <laughs> <laughs> after this guy wow and so they said you you need to have night train lane come over here and play and uh, you know and then they said the coach told him to, to have me come mm. so i went over there and I, you know, tried to play, and I told them my name, which was my real name, and they're looking for Dick Knight Train Lane. Not, they're looking for the real one. one. <laughs> and so, they, you know, and they keep telling me, you know, that, right. uh, you know, no, 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 you can't come play. You know, looking at me and saying, you're not able to play. <laughs> and so that, it just so happened those guys were coming over and said, this is the guy we were telling you about. So eventually they gave me an opportunity to come out there and they gave me a uniform that was three sides my size and the big shoes and stuff and had me playing a nose tack position. All I wanted to do is just get out there. Yeah. So it blossomed from there, you know, mm -hmm. I, I eventually became a star on the, on the ju in junior high school football, you know, playing the running back position. And then when I got into in the, in the ninth grade, uh, actually something else happened. I got so popular names and stuff in the paper, I thought all I had to do was just go to school and then I know hey everything else would be gravy so what I, when I said gr going to school that mean literally I was going to school after everybody else was coming for football practice <laughs> okay, <laughs> I wasn't right. going for class I was going for football, uh, going for football. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I thought you know that hey it, being an athlete and yeah. paper staying you good all that doing they're gonna give me the grades and I was gonna make it well so so you know maybe fast forward a little bit Having said that, when did you kind of things turn around so that you were prepared for college? Well, it, it started right there, what I'm telling you, because the teacher flunked me. She oh. flunked me, and I could not play football. Oh. Uh, so, so it was that. that it was at that point mm -hmm. that propelled me and said, hey, you, and then the coaches, you know, they, they tried to get her, but they, she stuck to her grounds. Mm. And I'm glad she did, because then it, uh, it made me understand and know that, hey, you have to get an education just as well as because it wasn't guaranteed I was going to be that professional athlete. Mm. And so it, it prepared from there. And I went on from that stand, became on a student. And uh, the, wow. the rest is history. You it, know, I went on, this started is so four years in high school, mm. yeah. four years in college. University uh, of uh, University of Arkansas, Arkansas at Pine Bluff. I formed the Arkansas mm -hmm. AMN College. Mm -hmm. and then I went on, and, and I wasn't drafted. That's the good thing about it, too. Never was drafted. But I had that determination. Mm. to say you can do it and I wouldn't let anything else get in the way. This. What was your degree? I'm just curious. What was your degree in a, college? I have an undergraduate degree in industrial education. And you have a and I have a master's degree in nonprofit organization. Okay. From so Case. look, we got it. We wow. got it. This is just like so fascinating. I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, but tell us how you got to the Cleveland Browns and then um, real quickly if we have time want to touch on the organization that you're involved with. Okay. okay. Well, actually what happened is I wasn't drafted out of out of college. So there was two, a couple of teams trying to get me, uh, the, the uh, Atlanta Falcons and the Kansas City Chiefs. Mm -hmm. And I figured I had a better shot at making the Kansas City Chiefs team than the Atlanta Falcons. So I walked on as a free agent and I was drafted. I mean, I wasn't drafted, so I made the team. Mm -hmm. And then after, Hank Strand was the coach during that time. And so uh, another former Cleveland Brown, Paul Wiggins, they fired Hank Strand, they brought Paul Wiggins in. It's supposed to have been one of the most intense searches in the history of professional football for a head coach. So he comes in and he tells me I was going to be a starting. He moved me from halfback to fullback. I was going to be a starting fullback. Told me to go game weight. I did. And, and, and so what actually happened, he, when he came in, he moved me back and not telling me. And then he wouldn't play me. And the next thing you know is that I was rele relegated to bits. We got into an altercation and then he released me. 
Mm. Cleveland Browns was the only team playing against Kansas City at the time. I wanted to show them they made a mistake. Right. Huh. Okay. So I'll, I'll show you. So right. that's how I came. That's how I got to Cleveland. Oh wow! Well, we are so glad you came. So it's kind of yeah. like on a, you know, <laughs> kind of like a dare, kind of like a. Yeah. Well, like, it's, you know, it's a lot more to it, but we have to right. have more time really to talk about it. Okay. Sounds like a book it. to me. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, people have told me I need to write a book, and I and I've been flirting around with the uh, the the op opportunity of doing it at some point in time before I. Uh, while I'm still here. Yeah. Right, right, before you check out. <laughs> yeah, before I yeah, check yeah. out. And then you yeah. have to come back and talk to us about your book. Right, right. Mm -hmm. exactly. Okay, well, you know what, Cleo? Um, it's been so good having you on. We got to have you back. And uh, just anything you want to plug with the uh, the organization with yeah. you're with, and then we got Universal get out Negro there. Improvement Association and African Communities African Communities League. Mm -hmm. Yes, you mm -hmm. know that is the organization. So the, it was the largest minority organization ever assembled in the world. It was founded by Marcus Garvey. It is the organization that gave African American peoples their racial consciousness. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it, it before, back in the twenties, it did a Declaration of Rights before the League of Nations to stand up for the rights of us as a race of people. Okay. It is the one that gave you that red, black, and green flag because it used to be said, you know, a, a race without a flag had no conscience or anything along that line. They, they weren't worth anything. So this organization gave that to us too. Okay. And as I say, it is my task now to bring that organization back together worldwide, and we, it is a spiritual-based organization as well. Okay. Very quick number or email if anybody wants to find out more information about it. You got a quick number for us? Well, actually, yes. You can call uh, 216 Four seven five three five nine nine. Three five nine nine. Two one six four seven five three five nine nine. nine. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, anyway, thanks, Cleo. Got to have you back. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, actually, you can go on the website at, at, at the U, UNIACL dot com or NegroWorld dot com and find our information. Okay. 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 Anyway, we are going to take a quick commercial break and then wrap it up on the other side. Stay with us. We'll be right back.